Thank you. All right, so I'll read the opening statement. Um, this is a regular monthly meeting of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission um, being held electronically via Zoom on July 19th, 2021 at 4 p.m. Uh, pursuant to section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place and agenda of this meeting has been noticed by transmitting a copy to Princeton Packet, Town Topics, The Times, Trentonian, and by following a copy with the clerk of Princeton, who has posted it to the municipal website, www.princetonnj.gov slash meetings, pursuant to Executive Order 107, due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19 coronavirus, notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Historic Preservation Commission will be held electronically via Zoom. Such notices have been placed on the official bulletin board at the municipal complex and on the Princeton website and are to be maintained throughout the year. On Ed's here. Okay, um, I guess just the, Elizabeth, do you wanna do the roll call? You're on mute. Sorry, Ms. Capazzoli? I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Endersby, he's waiting for someone to send him a link. He just emailed me, he can't get. Oh, okay. do you want me to send him a link? If you could. Ms. Okay. Sa Ms. Satterfield? Here. Mr. Shore? Mr. Shatskin? Here. Ms. Campbell? Ms. DeSanzo? Here. Ms. Howard, Mr. Pyle. Who? Okay, we have a quorum. All right. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any announcements? Um, no, but uh, I was wondering if we could possibly consider, um, I have to be out of town the end of next week and um, the following week, and we have to put everything up 10 days before our meeting, which is August 16th, which means I have to have everything by the 6th. And I'm afraid when I come back that day, I'm not gonna have everything in time. So if for some reason, and I am waiting for an applicant who was supposed to be on this month, who had asked to be pushed back, which was, I think it's 25 Lytle. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't received any of their packaging yet. So if for some reason we couldn't make that Date. Is our members able or willing to perhaps push the meeting back a week? I'd like to keep it if possible, but I'm not sure that I can get everything done and post it on there by 10 days. I mean, would it be would it be easier and safer if we did it on the 30th instead of the 23rd? Would that give you enough time? Sure. I mean, either one. I think that if I just had at least another week but it's, it's up to what the uh, schedule is available to the members and also to the attorney and our reporting secretary and our liaison. <laughs> Ed, do you have any issues with either the 23rd or the 30th? No. Okay. Does anyone else? Because maybe it's safer to do the 30th and that way the applicant will have time to get their stuff in and you'll have time to write, you know, what you need to, um, you know, and there'll be noticing time and all that business. Okay. Does any of the members here have any um, problems with changing it to either of those dates? Roger or Carrie? I saw yeah. that Thomas said okay. Fine. Okay. Shirley, are you okay? If we is the thirtieth of this month? August. No, thirtieth of August. I'm okay. Okay. Elric is in the attendees. He can be promoted if somebody. Yeah. Uh... Okay. So. So if you don't mind, I think the 30th might, might be safer. Okay. 
I'm on the Zoom. I'll call you later. Let's see. Is he coming on? Here he comes. Let me see. Yeah, I see Elric. Okay. Thank you, David. But Roger, okay. Roger dropped off. Oh, no. oh yeah, we're. Oh shoot. Okay, hold what on. Is, what is going on with the Zoom today? Oh, I don't know. Oh my gosh, what's going on? Elric is sharing a document. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't should laugh. This is like. <laughs> Am I back? I'm... Okay. Hey. All right, right. Oh, Elric made it. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. El Elric, just so you know, if you didn't. If you couldn't hear, um, I was asking if uh, any of the members had a problem if I wanted to push the meeting date to the 23rd or 30th, but Julie is recommending August 30th, just so there's adequate time. Is there any conflict for you? No, good. Okay, okay. Justin, are you good with that as well? Yes, I am. Thank you. David Cohen, are you okay? Thank you. Yep. Perfect, thank you very much. All right, that's great. All right. so. All right, so our next meeting is going to be August 30th. So we're going to have a nice break there. Um, we do have minutes uh, from June 7th. Um, 28th. Oh, June 28th. Is that right? Yes. OK, I read them and they were great. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> um, you, do, you do such a good job. Thank you. Um, did anyone have changes? Uh, that's right. I'm holding them in my hand. June 28th. Um, Justin had a placeholder for uh, Rolf Bond. The spelling yeah, of the name. Uh -huh. Yeah. I have a few comments. Yes. All right. Um, and I don't have it in front of me because my Anyways, long story. No printer, no no internet at the office. Um, in the paragraph on the um, on the house on Lee Avenue, um, what page? On that first page, I guess um, the paragraph that starts "Member enters the," which is like the fifth one down, as I recall. The last sentence describes the front door knob, and it just should be singular. Um, the inside, it, usually the outside would be brass. But sometimes they would be glass on the inside, not brass. That's not that's really minor. Um, but you, uh, Justin, you asked about the spelling for Rolf Bowen, and that's R O L F E. Bowen is B A U H A N. And that's a little further in the in the commentary there. I don't think there's an E on the Rolf. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I don't believe there's an E on the Ralph. I think it's R O L F. I'll double check on that. But anyway, it's not Ralph. Got it. Uh, and when uh, near the end, we we're talking about our site visit to uh, the waste management area. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm quoted it's about the uh, about the. Uh, the pump house, and I was advocating that it be preserved. Uh, but at the end of the sentence, it goes on into solar and whatever, which really did, isn't in context, and it's pretty. Un, it, it doesn't make any sense. I don't understand the screening myself. So the end of the sentence should just, should just the last word should be pump house. The, er, there's no good reason for demolition of the pump house. See that, and then the rest of the sentence can just be jettisoned. Okay. So, period after pump house, and then continue with Mr. Mr. Member Pyle asked about the public works, right? So take out the part about the solar panels. Not the part about the Brown Water Navy. I was I drafted a uh, picture for <laughs> David Cohen. That's our new Navy. <laughs> All right, yeah, the Princeton Navy. <laughs> we needed that the other day. <laughs> yep. All right, 
Well, with those changes, um, are there, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Okay. Mr. Pyle and a second. Okay, Elric seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, well, since we have a quorum, let's move on to our application, which is um, 86 Lee Avenue. Uh, could we make sure all the applicants have been moved over as panelists? Um, Excuse me, what about the resolution? We'll do that later. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, for some reason, why am I missing that? Because I wasn't looking at the right agenda. <laughs> yeah, no, we need to do the resolution. Um, we need to do the resolution for 86 Lee Avenue, the application of James Harley and Catherine McLennan. Um, we gave them an approval and um, let's see, I have a copy of the resolution here. I'm just opening it. There we go. It looked good to me. I didn't see any changes. Um, so uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Thank you, Roger. Second. Okay, Elric is seconding. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carried. So um, that was the approval for uh, the resolution for 8688 Lee Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, all right, thank you so much for pointing that out. Now we're moving on to the application um, of 33 Green Street. I see Kirsten. Hi there. Uh, hi. Madam Chair, um, yes. if I could just um, let people know, there is a problem with this Zoom tonight. Um, oh. our, our attorney has had problems. I know that Rogers had problems. I know that Carrie was on and off. So I just want everyone to be alerted that there could be additional problems from just connection and everything like that. So if everyone could just be patient. And if you do get kicked off, please just try to join in again. Um, I think, and if it freezes again, try to just log off and then join in again. Okay. Um, so right now we seem to be going ahead um, with the application. Um, I will cross my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ed. Uh, are you, if you're ready, I'll swear Kristen in. Kristen, you ready? I'm ready. Where the testimony you're about to give is truthful. Yes. Thank you very much. If you could state your name, your address, and then uh, Elizabeth will read her report. Okay. Uh, name, Kirsten Thoft. Address, 45 Linden Lane, Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, that it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Now, um, Elizabeth, I know you wrote a report, so um, maybe you just want to give a little summary. Okay, um, just for the record, I'll just kind of state the property, 33 Green Street. The applicant is, is Kirsten Thoft and Ted Nadeau. Nat Nadeau? Nadeau. Thank you. Um, and um, they are coming in to demolish the rear one-story addition foundation in the back and possibly the, um, the side walls. And um, they are also asking to put a second floor addition on top of that in addition to changing the roof line, which is a low pitch, fairly flat roof in the middle section and changing it to a gable roof. They'll also be asking for some additional improvements on the house, uh, the existing house, um, 
replacing a few windows, adding one new one, and changing some of the uh, components of the front porch, which I'll get into later. So this application is, um, uh, is an existing single family residence, which is a permitted use. And because of that roof change, um, it does require variances. The project site is identified as block 17.02, lot 107 in the Princeton tax map with the address of 33 Green Street, situated on the north side of the street, which is the second half of the corner of John Street. It's in the R4 zone of the former borough, and it sits within the Witherspoon Jackson Historic District, which is a residential neighbor of the municipal zoning overlay map. Um, HPC serves as advisory to the zoning board on this application and the applicant, um, and I'm going to confirm with our uh, HPC attorney that they have uh, met all the requirements for demolition. Yes. Thank you. Um, this property is within the type two historic district, which is um, preview from the public right of way and any type of prime mm -hmm non-prime surfaces um, and new surfaces will be reviewed by HPC. Um, this property is considered, considered contributing to the Witherspoon Jackson overall setting and significance of this district. Um, it was just an overview of the property. It was built circa 1850 in a vernacular style. It is existing two story with a lean to one story rear addition, which was talked about. The front of the house has a side gabled roof and the below sloping rear shed roof, which is extension on the back. Um, it has a full width porch, which was originally built as open. And since then it has been closed and it's enclosed. It has two elliptical fan light transoms over the porch bays and one fan light over each of the side windows. Windows on the second floor of the front facade are one over one replacements and slightly off center to the right. West elevation windows are also one over one. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, so I think that I talked about what improvements the applicant is asking for. Um, besides, uh, just to kind of talk about some of the improvements on the existing house, on the west elevation, they will be placing a small window on the existing uh, one story addition in the rear to just a larger window, which is gonna match most of the windows on the rest of the existing house. Um, they will be putting a new window in on that west first floor elevation in between two other existing windows and it should match as far as dimensions and style. Um, so all the windows that are gonna be replaced are new are gonna be two over, excuse me, one over one, which are visible from the public right of way. There are other changes in the rear, although that is not gonna be visible. There's also a replacement on the east elevation on the, the existing one story. Again, that's gonna match the one on the, the west side, but that probably is not gonna be visible because I believe it's behind a fence and it's so tightly um, situated between the adjacent property. So um, we're just gonna keep moving on. This is a very modest um, modification to the existing house. Oh, the other thing that they're doing is that the existing ports, the windows that are facing the street, they would like to change the hardware on that so they can be removed and add some new uh, screen panels, which are gonna be built so they can be used during the warmer season. So um, if you looked at the package, I think that you saw the color scheme in which the applicant would like to change the material um, as far as the color goes, change the color of the front door, uh, the new siding, um, some of the, the trim as well. Um, so just to go to the comments now, so the proposed application will construct a very modest addition of an existing one-story rear structure. The addition will not extend beyond the existing building width and its roof line will be lower than the existing roof line. The rear foundation will be reconstructed and possibly the exterior walls uh, be constructed also to ensure structural stability, which seems reasonable and necessary. New windows on the addition on the existing house will be consistent in style and similar in size to existing windows. The applicant is commended for their modest and sensitive proposal to the historic house in the Witherspoon Jackson Historic District. Uh, the center portion of the existing roof will be demolished 
with a new gable roof built. So the applicant intends to make that change to create more ceiling height to the minimum seven foot building code. But it should be noted that under the rehabilitation code, historic buildings are actually not subject to these requirements if it compromises historic integrity of the structure. However, with that said, the new roof line will not exceed the height of the existing front roof and is not expected to create any negative impact to the streetscape. Um, the desire to make the front porch usable during three more of the seasons is encouraged because as HBC uh, realizes, front porches in the Witherspoon Historic District are not only a defining architectural feature in the district, but also provides opportunity for social engagement that contributed to shaping the cultural fabric of this historic neighborhood. Um, it is recommended a new street tree to be planted in the public right of way space between existing trees on adjoining properties. That way it'll help encourage consistency of street trees within the neighborhood. Um, there is an existing, there's a, excuse me, a proposed wall sconce in the rear of the building. This fixture will not be visible, although some of the lighting may spill over to the public view and to the neighbor. So it is encouraged that the applicant considered a warm spectrum lighting, which is gonna be below the 3000 K. And um, there are a few comments for the, the applicant to address, which I will leave that to her. Um, and then just as far as this application, there are really just some basic things that HPC should consider. Uh, the demolition and rebuilding of the existing rear addition foundation, um, the demolition of the roof of the central portion of the building and the reconstruction of a new gable roof, changes to the front porch windows, new windows and replacements on the first floor and west elevations, and material of new addition improvements to the existing house, and the color scheme for the house. Oh, one thing that I didn't uh, mention on here, uh, which was in the report, is that the, the porch windows, if there's an opportunity uh, possibly to actually remount them or anything where they actually could still be open and closed during inclement weather to protect the porch because I believe, and Kristen, I'll leave it up to you, but it seems like you're gonna be taking off the window panels and replacing it with screens. Um, so it would be open to the element. If there's an opportunity to be able to keep them and have them open outward and keep the screen inside, that might be something that might be desirable. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And just to remind everyone, um, uh, we are just advisory to zoning on this. So we're just going to be um, creating a memo with our comments and then it moves on to zoning for the variance. Um, anyway, Kristen, did you have anything to add for that? Um, uh, just one comment about the roof issue. The reason that I, um, I mean, it will be nice to get a normal ceiling height because the ceiling height is six foot 11 in the middle of the house right now, actually in the whole second floor. Um, but uh, when I put the second floor addition on that rear piece, which is actually as of right, that's not what I need a zoning variance for. Um, the, if I pitch that roof, then the slope of the flat roof runs right into the new pitch roof. And that's really why I thought I better raise the center portion because if I were to continue the slope of that roof, I would end up at like six foot four or less ceiling oh. height on the outside edge. So that was the initial thing that prompted the need to change that middle roof. Got it. Um, and then, I mean, everything else seems pretty clear to me. It's uh, the, the, what I think is the existing, the, the original siding is underneath the aluminum siding that's brown that you see most everywhere. Um, and there's a layer of aluminum siding, then there's a layer of uh, asphalt siding that looks like bricks. And uh, there's one place on the side of the house that there's an open space and uh, it looks as though the clabbered is still there. And I went up into the attic, the clabbered appears to be intact. So I'm hoping to get rid of all the extra siding and return it back to its clabbered. Um, 
And then the other comment I had, oh, the question about the porch um, windows is a good one. And it had not occurred to me that it might be good to protect the porch. And so I did talk to my contractor about the hardware that's required if you were to have a screen on the inside and be able to push the window out and pull it back in and have the windows not bang into one another. And it's um, complicated. And I, I think beyond the budget that I've got for that porch, um, he suggested, well, we could sort of alternatingly put screens on the outside of a couple of them so that you could swing the, um, the glass portion of the adjacent one or swing the glass portion 180 degrees to lay against the adjacent one, which seems like a, a good compromise as long as a screen on the outside is okay. Because that way, if it rains, you could actually just go into your porch and shut the windows rather than having to like go outside or something complicated. So um, I think other than that, I mean, there's a foundation in the back. It needs a foundation. Um, so I need to put one in and that's what the request for new foundation and also probably to get the foundation in taking down two, maybe all three of the existing first floor walls. The contractor su uh, suspects that there's a lot of rot in the floor. There may not even, I don't know what the sill plate condition is, but we would just be building it back in the same spot. Great. So are there any other questions? I think the drawings showed very nicely the historic development of the house. We appreciate that. That was a nice touch. I like doing that. I like the research, actually. I wish I could have found some pictures of it. I, I couldn't find anything on Green Street. Maybe Shirley has some. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's a very straightforward project. Um, are there, are there questions about, you know, what Kirsten's doing or any uh, comments? I sort of, I thought I saw a hardy plank specified in the, uh, the sheets. Is that your fallback if the clabbered isn't any good? Um. Yeah, though, I think the clabbered is probably good, but I also suspect that the rear addition does not have clabbered on it. I think it was probably an open porch. Um, I'm hoping there's clabbered in the middle section um, because it seems sort of of the Victorian era that the clabbered would have been put on, but I don't think it's in the back. So yeah, I, I, I guess there's a question of what to do with the sidewall and can I patch that in and maybe that needs to be Cedar clabbered, and then I can change to hardy plank. I mean, whatever, whatever I would do, I would make it seamless as seamless as possible. So, um, the I think the other reference to hardy plank was there's a color that I like very much of hardy plank, and I want to use that on the exterior. So maybe, uh, maybe I got confused with that. or something. But yeah. I, I've okay. used it on a couple of other projects, and I really like it. All right. Um, other uh, questions? Um, I just need see. to, I just want to ask for a clarification of your uh, your finishes, your colors. There's an, an, there's an extra eight and a half by 11 sheet with some colors on it. And then you have, um, on A15, you have colors that you're using on the exterior. Just, yep. just kind of clarify that. Um, I was asked to provide a Xerox of the actual paint chips. In I see. To okay. The drawings. And Got I would it. say none of them turn out satisfactorily as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be better on a screen. I could share my screen with you if you want to see. Sure. No, I well, think you could. Yeah, you could share your screen if you want to. You're right. I think the uh, A15 is pretty good, actually. I was just wondering why it was duplicated. Yeah, that's why. There. Okay. Are, are you able to see that? Yep. Not yet. Oh, yeah. That's the body. 
white trim just because the the windows that are there are vinyl windows so they're white mm -hmm. so i'm not replacing all the windows so you know i'll just do the trim to match the existing windows mm -hmm. um a slightly darker blue or gray i think on the paneling and the posts at the front porch and then this does not look quite as nice as it is in real life but it's a nice victorian kind of green mm -hmm. i realize that the house is kind of a mishmash of victorian and you know maybe not even greek revival maybe just maybe just vernacular but uh anyway i had to pick a color so that's what i did sure. you want me to stop sharing is there anything i could show you this is the piece on the side where you can see the original clabbered oh yeah thanks and this is the original clabbered inside the porch so those, those two match one another. So I'm hopeful that that goes around most of the building. Okay. Good. Okay. Looks good. All right. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions, comments? Um, this is Shirley. I'm on an iPad, so I can't hear a thing that's going on. I can just see people. But um, Miss um, Toft, is that your name? Yeah. Are you moving into this house? I am not, I'm going to sell this house. I, I built my own house on Linden Lane. And so- okay. I, just, I just have a concern about uh, our, our community being a commodity. That's, that's my concern. Well, I'm an architect and um, this is what I do for part of my living in addition to working with clients. And um, I, I think that if you ask anybody who lives in or near a house that I've done, they're happy that it exists, but- I can't hear you. Okay, well, I don't know how to defend myself. You know, <laughs> Shirley, I think the volume on the iPad is on the upper left-hand corner. If you click on, cause I'm using an iPad. Yeah, but I don't wanna mess up and then I'll lose something all together. Just go ahead, I'll do my best. Okay, anyway. It's, I'm pretty sure if you click in that upper left-hand corner, you can, at the far end, you can increase the volume. Oh, I lost you. <laughs> we can, you're still there. We just lost your video. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm not sure how to respond to that. <laughs> um, I mean, um, Great. I mean, I think we really have to stick to, um, Historic preservation yeah. issues. Can I do a motion to approve? Um, or we still have questions? I I don't think there are any questions. So yeah, if there's a motion. Motion um, to approve. Anyone want a second? Well, and, and it would be a motion to uh, endorse the project okay. to zoning, okay. correct, Ed? Yes, we'll do a memorandum from HPC to zoning, which will endorse the project. That's correct. Right. Um, with no qualifications. Um, is there a second to the motion? Why not? Okay, thanks, Elric. <laughs> okay, so it's been moved by Carrie, seconded by Elric. Um, to uh, recommend to the zoning board uh, a complete approval of the project. Um, and uh, we'll try to attend that zoning board meeting in um, support of your, of your project. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and we, oh, wait, we have to have a vote. <laughs> Sorry. Would you like me to take roll? Yes. Okay. Um. Ms. Capazzoli? Yes. Mr. Endersby? Yes. Ms. Satterfield? Shirley, you're muted. Um, yes, with reservations. <laughs> Mr. Shatskin? Yes. Ms. DeSanzo? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming in, Kirsten. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.
We'll see if the zoning zoning board. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. So the next item on our agenda is a discussion of a proposed historic preservation district designation for the Princeton Eating Clubs Prospect Avenue. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to talk about or should we just bring in, um, is it Clifford? Yes, Madam Chair, I brought in Clifford Zink and Sandy Harrison. Okay. Uh, um, and I, I'm going to leave it up to them to make the presentation. Okay, I just wanna be clear, there's no action going on today. This is merely a discussion, like a concept review, um, but we aren't taking any action. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm gonna yes. drop off since the applications are complete. Thank you so much, Ed, appreciate it. Enjoy, see you in the end of August. <laughs> I, I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you, all right. Um, Julie, before you do, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Just, just, just to be clear, like all we do is we we can make our recommendations, but Princeton University is under no obligation to listen to anything that we actually have to say. Correct? Oh, um, correct. In fact, this is um, only a discussion. Like I said, there's no um, there's no action we're taking. There's right. no um, nothing right now. We're just we're just listening to the concept right. um, from Clifford and Sandy. So but yeah. ap apropos that, could Elizabeth just spend a little bit of time explaining what the process is for establishing an historic district? Sure. Um, so I know that um, Clifford had reached out to me and asked me about that as well. And I did refer him to sections of the ordinance, which I'll try to pull up as I'm talking with you. And those of the members who were here in 2017, was it? Uh, where Witherspoon Jackson Historic District came through. That was the first one that came through with the consolidated uh, municipality and the first one where they had used the ordinance. Um, that section, sorry, um, there is a section within the ordinance which talks about the procedures for recommending designation of historic sites, structures, features, historic preservation districts or historic preservation buffer districts. And that's under section 10B-392. And it talks about procedures for designation and it's actually very similar if you go to the state and national where you have to have, you know, there's documentation, photographs, tax map, lock and block, a uh, site plan, a property delineation, the geographic limits you're looking at, uh, looking at the existing zone, the proposed districts, um, whether you're recommending a type one or type two, um, any type of nomination report and physical descriptions and statements addressing uh, the significance in American history, architecture, archaeology, archae culture, and engineering that is present in the proposed district sites, features, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's also talks about um, uh, for districts and sites, there are other criteria which are features listed on the state and national register of stored places. Again, this, the statement of significance, um, whether the historic preservation chooses a study, but this is actually uh, something that's coming through from an outside party or individual. They're coming through and asking for the recommendation of this designation, which is the appropriate way they come to HPC and they make that recommendation. And at that point, HPC will review the documentation that's required and determine if they would support that. If they do support it, then it would go to the planning board. And then um, from there, the, the planning board would make their decision also whether they would support it and it, then it would go to council. In between, there are meetings with the public because obviously we want to make this as transparent as possible and engage input and questioning with them as well. So um, again, if anyone wasn't 
aware of what happened with the Wisdom Jackson, that's actually a perfect example. And their report, which was presented to HPC, is on the municipal website. Um, I think it's found on the historic preservation page. So if anyone wants to look at that, and what they did is they went through and they did property inventories of every single property that was within the designation of the district they were recommending. Um, and then uh, their criteria for designating historic sites. Again, that's under section 10B394. Um, it talks about how the commission may make a recommendation to the planning board as discussed. Um, they talk about anything that is associated with events of a significant contribution to the broad spectrum of culture, pol uh, political, economic, architectural, social history of the locality, region, state, or nation, association with lives of persons significant to our past or um, uh, embodied the distinctive character of a type, period, or method of construction, uh, represents the work of master, um, possesses high artistic value, or represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. Um, I'm just, I don't want to read everything, but I just want to give, you know, some information about visual quality, um, talk about the boundaries, um, if there's any political divisions, uh, differences in land use, you know, so, so all the components that, that you would think about um, uh, land use, land development, land um, occupancy, um, architectural and ar archeological, historic are all components which are um, taken into consideration when there is a uh, designation or recommended designation of a historic district. So uh, with that, um, there is a section within the ordinance which also talks about concept review of this where the, where the um, entity comes before HPC. And I believe that is what um, Clifford Zink and Sandy Harrison doing, they're coming in early on. They wanna have a discussion about what boundaries that they feel work the best at this point. And I believe that you saw the, the link and the connection that was sent to you on this that shows which was the original one, which was a, a map that was done by the for, former, actually, I don't really know who did it. I, I tried to find out, but I believe that it was um, part of the, the, um, the borough HPC uh, that were considering it. I know that there was discussions with the Eden Club, I believe the university. I know that there was discussions with the, the planning board as well. And I think that Mr. Zink is probably has more information on that, on uh, how far it went. I know that it, you know, it did not uh, obviously elevate to being uh, designated at that point. I think that there was some resistance and that's why it came in as a recommended district on the master plan at that time. All right. Well, I guess, um, oh, yes, Mr. Pyle. This raises a couple of questions. Thank you very much for that good review. Um, new as I am relatively to this body, I have three questions arising as we begin this consideration only in concept. The first is, how were these criteria developed? Um, we have, it sounds like these were developed in the borough rather than the township. And uh, then that raises the second question, which is, is, has there been any consolidation of these concepts or criteria to rationalize across the whole new municipality? And then third is um, for us as a, uh, as a uh, body of the municipality, do we have our own strategy? Have we uh, decided whether to review or to update or augment or streamline or condense any of these many regulations? So. I'm particularly interested in the development of the criteria because I can imagine over many years uh, have been added more and more regulations on top of other regulations and so on. So as we're getting ready to receive a concept paper, do we ourselves have a good idea of what is the framework in which we want to operate? Uh, so Madam Chair, I could answer this quickly and I, I think that you'll probably join in uh, as being a former uh, township and then a consolidated member. Oh, so Thomas, the, um, the ordinance actually comes from the consolidated borough and township. And I believe that, um, that HPC was the, was the first body that actually consolidated the ordinance um, mm -hmm. at the time of the consolidation of the municipalities. 
So um, there was a joining of the borough and township when they came through with um, developing this ordinance. So the ordinance sections that I had quoted is from the current ordinance. Um, so Madam Chair, I mean, she was involved. I know that there was a, a subcommittee and an attorney that worked with HPC at that time. I was not on the HPC at that time. So, so um, Julie, you might have some more information as well as other members. Yeah, and I believe the ordinance um, really comes from the both the borough and the township ordinances were very similar in terms of process. And um, a lot of the, the material comes from the Secretary of the Interior's uh, standards. So um, this is uh, guided by federal guidelines, which in turn influence state guidelines, which in turn influence local gui guidelines. So it's pretty standard. I mean, we're not coming up with our own unique set of criteria. Um, yeah, Elric? Well, I, I think maybe I'm the only one, well, no, Shirley may have been part of the commission at that point as well. What was good was that, uh, uh, and I know you were, but um, <laughs> they went through and they compared paragraph by paragraph. And it turned out that a, a sizable percentage was identical or, or almost identical. And, it, and that made the task easier so that we could find the areas which weren't covered by one municipality and not by the other or treated differently. And, and yes, it was months before any of the other uh, committees or commissions uh, came up with a unified um, ordinance that, as we did. <clears throat> And the ordinance itself has a kind of Solomonic solution for the borough and the township. If you've heard, um, if you've heard discussion of a type one and a type two district, in essence, we, we codified differences between the township and the borough in those two types of districts. So it's a longer story, but that's where type one and type two came from. Right. So the criteria for a type one district is basically the former township criteria and the criteria for a type two district is basically the former borough criteria. Um, and that's how we ended up merging the two. Um, now Witherspoon Jackson is interesting because it really included both borough, former oh. borough and former township, but the, um, uh, the criteria for the borough seemed to work better. So we ended up with a type two district there. It's a little less uh, strict on, on the view shed. Um, so anyway, there would always be a question um, of, as to what type uh, of district they're proposing. And also we've always kept the door open for a third type of district. So there could be something um, completely different proposed that was neither type one or type two. So um, anyway, I wanna hand it over to Clifford so he could discuss what they, what they wanna go ahead with. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, thank you, Elizabeth and Julie for scheduling this concept presentation. Um, so I'm not really familiar with the distinction between a type one and a type two district. So that is something I'll have to learn about in the future. Uh, so um, this is a- We could use a little more volume. More volume, okay. So, uh, so this is really, you know, we view this, uh, I'm working with the Princeton Prospect Foundation on this. And we view this as kind of a restart of uh, the, the district initiation that actually started in back in 1992, and then actually had public hearings and public meetings in 1995. So this is not starting from scratch uh, like other districts have done. This is actually looking at what we've already got in place and kind of restarting the effort again. So can I uh, share my screen? Yes. Sure. Uh, 
Okay, so you can see this document? Yep. Okay, so very interesting to me anyway, is that this notice of a special meeting took place, the meeting took place on July 19th. Yeah. <laughs> 26 years ago. I don't know if that means the stars are aligned or what it means, but <laughs> very unusual when I when I saw that. And um, also down the bottom, Mrs. Satterfield uh, is listed here as being on the HPC and deserves mm -hmm. the borough. Mm -hmm. borough and deserves a great deal of credit for all the years of service that she's given. And um, also Mayor Freda is listed here at the time he was council president. And up at the top, uh, in the second line under notice, you can see it says that this meeting was at the Princeton Charter Club. So there were some clubs that were opposed to the district, but other clubs were in favor. And certainly Charter Club was one of the ones in favor. So as part of uh, this effort in 1995, there were some articles in the newspaper and this article in Town Topics, May 10th, 1995, before the July hearing, talks about a potential zoning change from E, I think it was either E1 or E2 to residential on Prospect Avenue. And then it talked about the historic district. And there's a quote in here from uh, Wanda Gunning, and she says it's important to look at Prospect as a group and a unique configura configuration of fine architecture. I'd like to see a really wonderful group of buildings by fine, these buildings by fine architects preserved as a group and see the architectural heritage of Prospect Avenue become part of the town's heritage. It is surely one of Princeton's assets. And then Mayor Reed said, we want to look at this as a future possibility of what might happen. We want to maintain the character of the street in the future. Prospect Avenue serves as a transition zone between the academic campus and the residential community. And so I think those two uh, comments are completely applicable to this present effort. So here is the document from 1995. You can see it was originally, uh, originally drafted in 1992. And uh, it was also revised in part by Ernie Dale and Yu Wen down the bottom, both Princeton class of uh, 39, I believe. And some people will remember them. They were, I think, both on the board of the Historical Society and were very, very strong on Princeton history. So this document is a total of 56 pages and it had all the requirements at the time that Elizabeth enumerated in terms of the statement of significance, description, uh, individual description of each one of the properties, the boundary, et cetera. It's all in this document from 1995. And then in 97 and then updated in 2012, as I think everyone here knows, the master plan included suggested historic sites. There are about 38 suggested sites in, the, uh, in what was the borough and the township. And the number one suggested site is the Club Row Historic District. And uh, I think it's number one because the people that put this together thought of it as the most important historic district to be designated. So then in 2017, the Princeton Prospect Foundation uh, commissioned a boundary increase and additional documentation for the National Register of Princeton Historic District. And this is the first page of it. And the purpose of this was to expand the boundary to include a terrace club, which when the Princeton Historic District was established in 1975, did not include terrace club. So that was one purpose of this document. And the second pur purpose was to 
document the history and the significance of all the eating clubs. So this document is 138 pages, has uh, complete documentation of every one of the clubhouses, uh, including interiors. I wouldn't say complete interiors, but all the important rooms. And uh, it has the statement of significance and all the other um, descriptions and areas of significance, et cetera, the period of significance that Elizabeth identified. So we really have two documents and that means a lot of the material to put together this district now in 2021 is in place and really needs to be uh, updated and uh, formatted uh, for, the, for, for 2021. So I did this sample of a page that, um, a description page that could be in such a documentation for 2021. And so it shows here uh, Charter Club, which seemed an appropriate one to choose. And it shows when it was uh, founded, when the building was built, the block and lot number, architect style, and then it goes on to uh, describe the important features of the building, both on the front and on the back. So this would be done for every one of the clubs and also for the other buildings uh, that are that are uh, in the district. So one, one aspect of this that is very, um, very interesting to me is that um, it provides an opportunity for me to correct something that, uh, that I didn't realize I had neglected when I put together the uh, book, The Princeton Eating Clubs. And that is uh, the role of uh, Black Princetonians in the, in the eating clubs. And so I see this as an opportunity to really, uh, really uh, do some additional research and to highlight, you know, we'll never know exactly what all the relationships were, but I think we can get a sense uh, of the relationship between the eating clubs and uh, the Witherspoon Jackson area. So this photograph is of an informal eating club before the current and a few ones that went out of business before the current eating clubs were incorporated. The students uh, got together, you know, classmates got together and they formed informal eating clubs and they boarded at somebody's house and this was because the university, the College of New Jersey at the time was not providing adequate food service. So the young men were on their own. The man holding the hat is- yeah, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. And, and he is class of 79. And uh, so, uh, and I was fascinated when I saw this photograph to see not only Woodrow Wilson, but behind him, is uh, what the clubs used to call the steward. And the steward was the man who uh, supervised what went on inside both the informal eating clubs and then later the formal ones. And so there was probably a cook in the kitchen and it was up to the steward to organize the meals with the cook and then to serve the meals and interact with the young men. And I think it is very safe for us to say that uh, this man would not be in the photo if he did not have some kind of relationship with these students and, and that they invited him to participate in this photo. And so that says a lot right there that there was uh, a kind of interaction. This is before, this is actually the year that Ivy Club was founded. So this is right at the beginning of the, of the current eating clubs and the informal eating clubs go back to the 1850s. So I think the, the interaction uh, between Witherspoon Jackson and Prospect Avenue has been going on for a very long time. Here is uh, the second Ivy Club building, the first eating club built on Prospect Avenue you can see it says 1883 in the little uh, portico over the doorway. And uh, this photo was probably taken in 1884. 
It was taken by a very prominent New York photography company called Hawk Brothers. And so they were hired by Ivy Club to come down and take this photo. And this is only a portion of the photo. So this is a portrait photo of this, uh, the first eating club on Prospect and also the first eating club incorporated. And here we have a steward, one of the stewards from the, most likely from the Witherspoon Jackson area. Uh, and you know, he's standing in the doorway and they would not have invited him to stand in the doorway if he did not if he did not fulfill an important role in the experience of this club back then. And then here's the uh, third example I'll show, which is uh, an unnamed eating club. This is from these, all these photos are from Sealy Mudd Library. This one is dated 1888 and we don't know where it is and we don't know the club. And uh, but we can see that there's uh, another steward in the back and all these stewards are well-dressed. They're obviously in a position of service to these young men, but you know, they're, they're, they have a, a level of dignity, I think, that is evidenced by the way they are attired and also by the fact that they were invited to participate in the photographs. So then uh, when I was doing the Eating Club's book, just about the end of the process, when the book was ready to go to the printer, I came across this document. And this was published in 1950 in the Key and Seal Club. Uh, they had kind of an annual report. And this, this is a kind of a memoir from Oscar Wright. And he worked at Key and Seal Club for 45 years. He started in 1905. And he talks here about his working at the clubs and his relationship. And you can see here, uh, it isn't until I remember how many of my boys, I guess that I've always thought of you as my boys, have gone out from the club. And this really helped me understand uh, the strong interactions that took place. And then in discussions with Shirley and also uh, reading the book by uh, Catherine uh, Waterman, uh, I Hear My People Singing. Uh, there are many references to um, people saying, my grandfather, my uncle, my father worked on the avenue. They called it the avenue. So uh, anyway, I see this, this, uh, this current designation as an opportunity to highlight this interaction. And it's actually interesting that it'll be an interaction between the uh, Prospect Avenue Historic District and the Witherspoon Jackson Historic District. So this photo is 1936, and it actually shows 19 eating clubs. Over here on Washington is a club that was called Arch Club. It was occupying a former uh, residence. It's right about where uh, where the pool is next to Princeton School of International Affairs. And uh, over here is uh, Gateway Club. And over here is Arbor Inn. And then we have Terrace. And then we have all the eating clubs lined up here. You can just barely see the roof of Court Club over here. We have the four eating clubs on the north side. And then we have the Ferris Thompson Wall. And the university and the Princeton Prospect Foundation are in the process of relining Prospect Avenue with trees. And I think you can see here, the street was completely lined with trees, except for right in front of the wall was left open. And then over here is 110 Prospect, which was uh, originally located over here where Key and Seal is, and it was moved there. It was a former Key and Seal club. So this green, outline shows uh, the outline of the proposed district right now. Of, of these other clubhouses, this one's obviously gone. Gateway was replaced by the Center for Jewish Life. Uh, the, uh, there's another building I didn't mention is the Osborne Field House here, which is also gone. God. And uh, Arbor Inn is still here, but is slated to be demolished. Uh, and by the university. And then here's the Olden House, which this of course, all this land was part of original Olden Farm. 
and the university moved that down to uh, down actually over here. That olden house is now over here. So I made a slight adjustment in this map. It's slightly different from the one that was posted. And that's because when I did the green outline for the proposed current boundary, I mistakenly it ran it all the way down here and included what at this time was called the Knights of Columbus. But this was uh, the former cap and gown club that was originally built here. And then in 1907, when the current cap and gown was built, it was moved down here and became another eating club. Sorry. So I've now adjusted this to exclude that because right now this is a vacant lot. So here are the, here is the, here is the club row of, uh, of 10 eating clubs all lined up here. Here's Terrace. Here are the four on that side of the street. Uh, the dark black line is the 1995 proposed outline. And so Olden House is gone. This is gone, Gateway and Arbor Inn is about to be demolished. So it didn't seem to make sense to include any of that. So this has shrunk, this area is no longer included. And then this, there was a portion of the boundary that went up here, uh, but this university has built new buildings over here. So it makes sense now just to go behind the back of the clubs. So is the wall and the gate part of your, of your uh, designation? Yes, yeah, so you can see this is pulled back slightly from the street. And so the wall and the gate would be part of it. And the wall, as you know, extends partly up Olden Avenue. And then over here we have uh, 110 Prospect, the former Key and Seal, 114, 116. And over here 120 is the uh, Prospect Apartments. So we can come back to that map. So, you know, why to include the Prospect Apartments? They were included in the 1995 uh, proposal and here's the rationale. It ties in visually with the district and makes a very strong transition at the eastern end. It was built in 1924, which is exactly the time that uh, the former Key and Seal Club was moved to 110 Prospect. And I think the other two houses at 114 and 116 were also moved there right around 1924. So this whole strip of the street between 116 and 120 all came together at the same time. And here are the other three houses. And these are included uh, as they were in the Prospect Avenue Historic District Report because they were moved to these sites after club use elsewhere on the street and are part of the district's visual and institutional history. And, uh, and they're certainly worthy of being preserved. And then of course, here's the Thompson Gate. This is a photograph from the National, uh, excuse me, from the New York Historical Society collection. So these gates are enormously significant and they were designed by McKim Mead and White who also designed the, uh, the main gates, Fitzrandolph gates at the front of the campus on Nassau Street. These tigers are marble. And uh, unfortunately, this upper portion of the uh, ironwork has been removed. This has been removed. So it goes up to here and then stops across here where the, uh, where the, um, where the, where the gates are. Um, I've had a very preliminary discussion with the university about restoring this. Um, and uh, hopefully someday that'll be done because these were pretty magnificent designed by McKim, Mead and White. So, and then of course we have this wonderful, wonderful photograph from 1911 and it has the rationale for why the Ferris Thompson Gateway and Wall have been included because of their strong relationship to the district. The eating clubs wanted to locate here and the reason that Ivy Club located here originally in 1883 as the first club on Prospect Avenue was to be close to the university field here. And you can see all the activity going on. And so this was the real center of Princeton social life. And in this photo, you can see 
the three buildings that are now moved down the street. This is now at number 110. This one is now at number 114. And this one is now, this one here is now at number 116. So we have a tremendous amount of documentation. And um, so the, the effort here is to update this documentation for our current uh, designation and also to include additional documentation about the relationship between Prospect Avenue and the Witherspoon Jackson Historic District. So with that, uh, before uh, taking any questions or comments from anybody, uh, Sandy Harrison, I think we'll say a few words. No. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, thank you uh, for the time. Um, so I'm the board chair of Princeton Prospect Foundation. I did appear before this uh, commission on June 7th in the court uh, clubhouse issue. And of course this, the purpose of this kind of stems from the concerns raised at that time and still going on, you know, the concerns might be an understatement. Um, so back in uh, 1995, you know, over a quarter century ago, there were reportedly some eating clubs that resisted the um, creation of a local historic district. I don't know how vociferous it was. I mean, clearly the university itself um, resisted, but that was to be expected. And, and of course they are likely to now, but that I don't think what I'm really here to say is that I don't think you, you know, if you're concerned about that um, aspect of it, I don't think you really need to be. Um, a lot has changed in the quarter century. Um, most of the leadership of the eating clubs, the, you know, the, the, specifically the graduate interclub council, which are alumni leadership of the clubs, um, most of them have been completely um, changed, you know, not totally, but almost complete turnover in that time. So there are different uh, people in, in, uh, in place there. So that's one factor. Secondly, um, the concern really would have been as far as we, you know, as far as we can tell, just, you know, that, um, the, you know, if there was a historic district, the clubs would be restricted in what they could do in terms of um, expansion or some renovations. And that was at that time that was concerned, but that really hasn't materialized. When you consider the fact that during the, during the time since 1995, cap and gown has had a substantial addition, Tiger Inn at the back, uh, Ivy Club, uh, Tower Club. Um, there, uh, even a, a quad was right around that type, quadrangle. Now, but notably, there's, they were, there was no um, re resistance to that happening that we were aware of. It went through. Now, of course, if there were a local district, the local district would have a, a say in it. But I think that the clubs realized that, A, almost all those additions were in the back and, you know, barely visible from the street and also were done in a way that was consistent with historic preservation and would not likely have resulted in anything other than maybe some minor suggestions by the historic provision by, by, by commission. Uh, I might add that Elm Club also had major additions. So that concern probably uh, shouldn't really exist now with the clubs anyway for, you know, because for what I just said also, it's kind of unlikely that the clubs would really have much more to do than they already have that would be out front where it would really matter out front of the clubs. So that was one thing, but the the main the main difference that right now why the clubs are you know I talked to the eating club leadership um, last week. Now not all the clubs, but the key people, the, the ones that really are the day to day. You know, effectively like an executive committee, and all of them agreed that they would definitely support the creation of a local historic district now. And what trumps all other considerations is the threat that is perceived now for very obvious reasons because of what we've been going through with the court clubhouse uh, controversy. And the threat is so palpable and real now. And you know maybe it wasn't as imagined then as it is now. And that is, and the worry of course is that with a university establishing, you know, kind of a beachhead on prospect that, you know, this could really, really threaten uh, the club's, um, you know, viability and, and 
uh, going forward. And, you know, it, I, I also will note that in that 25, six year period, almost all of the buildings that have, that are now owned by the university have been completely occupied and co-opted. Now, that is not objectionable because they are used for good purposes and they're well preserved, uh, especially on the outside. But as we can see, the next step after that is, well, maybe not just occupying, but moving and demolishing. And that's what we're really facing with the uh, court clubhouse situation now. So that brings the reality of it. So th those are really the reasons why I don't think that you, if, if you are concerned about resistance from the eating clubs, um, I, I don't see it happening because of, you know, I've caucused the key people and I, you know, if you would like, if, you know, I, I, I can go back and get a, an official statement from the GICC saying they support it, you know, either now or, you know, depending on how this process proceeds. Um, so, you know, I could always, I, I could do that, I'm sure. So that's really what I, that's, those were really my remarks that I wanted to emphasize. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, also, I, I think um, Clifford noted this, but, um, you know, what you're talking about cannot have a direct relationship with a pending application. So, yes. um, yeah, so we, you know, we realize the pending application, the two applications are, you know, grandfathered basically because they've already been submitted and they're under in the process of being heard. So this is really about the long-term future. This is not an effort to try and stop what's going on right now. This is about, as Sandy said, um, and as Marvin Reed said 26 years ago, you know, there's, there's going to be threats in the future to losing this district. Just like exactly uh, why Witherspoon Jackson was adopted as a district, because there were threats to the buildings in Witherspoon Jackson. So, so, so yes, this, this, uh, this process uh, is not being done to try and make any change in the existing applications. I would like I to add I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that um, the fact that you are considering going through with this um, may have some sort of intangible public um, pressure aspect to it, but we, you know, from a legal point of view, we recognize that, uh, uh, you know, as Clifford says, that it, it is grandfathered legally what they're doing. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, so I wanna open it up for questions for Clifford and Sandy, if there's questions on the presentation. Um, I don't have a question. I just have comments. First of all, um, Mr. Zink, I want to thank you for that beautiful book that you gave me when we were at Robert's house for lunch. And I, I mentioned then that there was nothing in there about the people who took care of all of the eating clubs. So I'm glad you're going to work on that. And if you need any assistance, I have lots of information. Um, there are a lot of my family members worked on the avenue and um, I can give you much information about it. And, and they would not have existed without the people who worked in the Witherspoon Jackson community, who lived in the Witherspoon Jackson community, not only the uh, university, but also the Princeton, uh, the Nassau Club, the Peacock Inn, all of those were supported and sustained by our people. So um, if you're going to include them, I would like to work with you on that. Well, that would be great. I'd appreciate that. And when you've talked before about your family working on the avenue, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, getting some anecdotes and names of people who work there and the clubs they worked at would be great documentation. And we also, you wanted to know if anyone knew about the two people whose names were at the bottom. Hugh Wynn um, was on the uh, Historical Society board when I was, so I do dearly remember him. And and so he and Ernie Dale, you know, my wife Emily was the director at that time. I was there when she was the director, yes. Yes, and uh, so she always spoke very highly of you and, and Ernie Dale, and they were really, really both gentlemen, great, greatly interested in town history. Right. And I want to make an interjection as well. First of all, Hugh Wynn was uh, JFK's freshman roommate when JFK was at Princeton. But getting back to 
um, the presence of, of Princeton's black community and the relationship to the, um, to the avenue, um, the entertainment, which has always been part of the clubs on, the, on, on Prospect, um, in many, many, many instances involved black musicians of great renown who had no other place to stay in Princeton but in the in the Witherspoon Jackson area and got to know the families and and since they got to see their own families too infrequently sort of adopted in some sense some of the kids that were in these families on on Green Street and Quarry Street etc. Uh, you probably have Thank some. You, yeah. you probably have some documentation of that in the recollector. Lots. Yeah, a whole a couple of issues. Right. Including, yeah. including uh, Don Lambert. Right. Well, that, you know, that'll be a, a excellent addendum or a, a, just an expansion, let's say, of the significance of this district and tying it to Witherspoon Jackson. Yeah, this Mimi. is a district that has been neglected for so long, and I'm finally glad that um, people are realizing that this is a community that sustained all of Princeton. And that's why I'm glad that we made it the 20th historic district. Well, I look forward to the collaboration. Uh, another thing I just want to point out is that if you look at the type one and type two categorization of districts, um, reflect on what you think uh, you would advocate for a potential district. Would it be um, like a type two or would it be less stringent? I mean, I think these are things to also think about is the approach mm -hmm. um, to the preservation because you know each district is different. Um, well, we realize the clubs are going to change as, um, as they have over the last century because uh, I think most people here know that those clubhouses were built for on average 24 upperclassmen. And now they have, for example, Ivy has 140 members, uh, upper class uh, members. So, you know, the clubs have had to change and expand. And as Sandy said, a lot of, most of the expansion has been on the back. Uh, in fact, the new cap and gown addition on, uh, on Roper Lane, right next to Roper Lane, is really the first, first construction in the front of any of the clubs. And when I put the book together, I was astounded at the quality of preservation on the inside and outside of the clubhouses and how intact uh, the, they've kept the exterior. Charter Club has the original windows from 1913 and uh, it's beautifully maintained, ironwork, light fixtures, and uh, on the interior, uh, again, I was astounded to see the level of preservation. So the clubs realized that the architecture is, and the quality of the architecture is a big, big asset to the clubs. And so they've naturally done an excellent job of preserving them. And in discussions with Sandy, we'll have to review the type one and type two but we don't feel that it would be too much of a burden for the clubs to bring in uh, applications where necessary to the HPC because in almost all cases, they are going to uh, do it very respectfully to the original building. Like for example, um, Tiger Inn has a big dining room addition on the side, which is partly visible from the street I believe David uh, Cohen was involved in that project. It's, no, you weren't. I would like to be able to say I was, but no. Oh. Okay, so anyway, it, next time you go down, if you haven't seen it, take a look at it. It's just beautifully done as a, you know, uh, Tudor revival uh, edition that matches or is very compatible with the front of Tiger Inn. So the clubs have had a natural tendency to do that. And we don't think this is going to be a terrible burden in the future. So, uh, but we'll, we'll have to take a look at with Elizabeth, the difference between type one and type two. All right, I, I thank you. 
Can I just add a couple of comments? Can yes, okay. sure. Uh, first, first of all, it was Steve Cohen, uh, not David Cohen, um, in the Tiger Inn. So maybe you have a alter ego. Oh, the other Cohen, the other architect Cohen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, also, um, some of the clubs are even more than 140. I mean, they're, they're, I think Tower Club right now might have over 200 upperclassmen members, just to give you an idea. Now, um, uh, the, the last comment is uh, Tom raised a question about the viability of the clubs financially, which is a separate question. Um, it is a concern. Uh, the, uh, it, it's expensive to run the clubs. There's always maintenance and, and the, you know, the, there is a threat of a different kind there to the clubs and that is that there are more options for students to eat now than ever. Uh, the two residential colleges will have eating options, the two that are being built. Uh, you know, First Campus Center hasn't been around forever. Uh, uh, co-ops, um, there are options now that, so that maybe two thirds to 70% of the students belong to eating clubs now, but um, it's not just the number of options, but it's affordability issue. So are the clubs worried about their long-term viability financially? The main issue there is the, uh, they're dependent on critical mass of members. If clubs lose members that, you know, and that goes on for a sustained period of time, they are really in trouble. In fact, most of the clubs that have folded over the last century have been because of financial pressure. So it is possible that one or two clubs could end up um, folding because of financial pressure, because of you know this competition and diminished uh, membership. Where, you know, the clubs are trying as hard in every way imaginable to address that, but that is um, you know that is a possibility. I don't see the total collapse of the system, but there could be another one or two that may may be victims. And I'm not saying next year, but down the road. So does that answer the question? Thank you. Yes, that's. Um, I'm a member of. Uh, I was. A, I am a member of Terrace Club. So, Sandy, you know, the difficulties that Terrace Club always had being on the margin. That was part of the revolutionary chic of being a Terrace Club member, a Terran, as we called ourselves. <clears throat> but uh, that seems to me to be the biggest challenge ahead of the clubs, particularly if we move into a new cycle, the new social cycle of egalitarianism and resistance to elitism, as for, uh, for is foreshadowed by current events. So I think uh, that presents a big challenge for the clubs financially. Mm -hmm. So uh, Tom, I really like your comment about uh, Prosper who worked at uh, Tower and 21 years later, he said hi to your father recognizing you. Without, a, without missing a beat, I, I, that really impressed my father and obviously me. Well, you know, a big portion of the lives of the people that work there, um, you know, was wrapped up in meeting new students every year and forming relationships with those students over, you know. And they obviously memorized the names very well. Yeah. Can I just ask the flip side to that question, Clifford? First of all, I really appreciate your presentation and I'm a big fan of your book about the Roebling Mills. <clears throat> Thank uh, you. <clears throat> and that's my question number two. And I asked this with Shirley in mind to see if she could offer uh, a broader perspective. It does sound to me that the uh, Black community in Princeton had a special relationship with the Avenue and provided a lot of the service infrastructure and so on. But as the photograph that you first showed with Woodrow Wilson in it and his Ivy Club cronies, there was clearly a uh, segregation going on there. Uh, and that photograph speaks, says it so visually where the steward is off on the side, uh, not in the main part of the picture, clearly outside the ring. Uh, so my question really is about the sensibilities of the local black community and how do they relate to, um, how, how do they themselves think of this prospect uh, club culture? Clearly they were the service providers and providing infrastructure and uh, gener generating their livelihoods there and so on. But as that photograph so clearly shows, nevertheless, they were uh, someone I would have to imagine clearly second-class citizens, servants though they were, but servile in some people's minds as they may have been considered. Um, I asked this question delicately to Shirley uh, because I would like to her to just help at least me understand what was the 
indigenous feeling among our uh, African American community towards the Prospect Street? Well, um, they were not, you see these pictures, but they weren't treated very nicely. I mean, they, they looked good and they were dressed well because that's how they had to be. But I remember uh, listening to Mr. Carson, who was a bartender at the Nassau Club. And um, all the workers, even though they worked there, they first of all had to go in the back door. And many of them, especially at the um, Nassau Club, had to wear gloves so their hands wouldn't touch the food or other things. So um, they were they were second class citizens. They were subservient, but um, some of them were respected because they were the only ones who really um, were friendly and loving to the men at the university. So I don't know if that answered your question or it not. Partly does. But um, I know when, when I know that um, a lot of our families after they worked at the eating clubs, they would come home. Um, they always say that our porches, that they want to be in this neighborhood because the porches are and were friendly. The porches had a purpose. And when they came home from working for the people in, the, in, in other neighborhoods or working at the eating clubs, they sat on those porches to rest and to get ready to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. And they would talk about how they were treated. I know my mm -hmm. mother would come home and talk about how she was treated, not just at the eating clubs, but for the people she worked for. So we were subservient, but we yeah. were respected um, for the love that we gave, I guess you can say. Right. I, I don't think, know Shirley, if that answered your question, but Shirley, did you, that answer your question? We're living in such a time of uh, cultural paroxysm, uh, given the Black Lives Matter movement. I can't movement. hear you. I'll type it out. <laughs> well, I'd like no, to, um, to we speak a little louder. <laughs> you know, we, we still iPad, have a presentation from Deanna Stockton on uh, Witherspoon. So um, I think the collaboration of research, uh, investigating the types of district, um, you know, there's more work to be done, but I think it's, it's very interesting. And, um, you know, we look forward to hearing from you again. Are there hands up in the public, um, Justin or Elizabeth? Um, yes, there is one. Oh, there's two. Okay, if we could um, hear from them. Sure, um, I will bring over James Bash. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, yes. we can hear Hi. you. Good Hi. afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Bash, and thank you for the opportunity to comment in support of a local historic district on Prospect Avenue. I've lived in Princeton for 21 years. Last week, there was a letter to the editor of Town Topics from Alan Medvin, who's lived here far longer since he moved here with his family in 1955. He writes, it became obvious very soon that there were two very special streets in Princeton. One, of course, was Nassau Street, and I include Palmer Square in that description, and the other was Prospect Avenue. Anytime we had friends come to Princeton for the first time, those were the two must-see places on our tour of the town. Nothing defines Princeton the way those two streets define the community in terms of its character and its beauty, unquote. And I agree wholeheartedly. Princeton has many wonderful neighborhoods throughout, but in my view, these are the two most extraordinary streets in our town. And when our guests visit, these two are the must-see places that we take them. In fact, W. Barksdale Maynard, the author of Princeton, America's Campus, dubbed Prospect Avenue the most beautiful suburban street in America. The iconic Eating Club Row a contiguous collection of 17 stately and majestic clubhouses dating back as far as the late 19th century is unique in the world to Princeton. The architectural grandeur of these exquisite manors rivals that of many magnificent mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. Much has been written about the clubs and their buildings for well over a century by authors all the way up to literary giants such as F. Scott Fitzgerald. Across the street, we have the three Victorians of Faculty Row, each of them supporting the others in a cohesive historical group. These significant 19th century homes are actually the oldest existing buildings on the street, predating all eating clubs there now. And they tell a different story, 
a story rich in the culture of humanities and the lives of the brilliant thinkers who lived and worked there over the past century, a number of them finding refuge from fascism in these lovely Queen Anne's. And their diverse story completes the long history of Prospect Avenue, a history that is not entirely about eating clubs. So the vast majority of people, both residents and visitors alike, realize there is something exceptional about Prospect Avenue. And they are happy to know that this area is listed on the New Jersey State and National Registers of Historic Places. But what most of them don't realize is that even being in a National Register Historic District might not be enough to adequately protect the unique historic character and streetscape of Prospect Avenue for the benefit of present and future generations. I mean, let's be honest. This is a special thing we have here. It is not found anywhere else in the world. If we lose it, if it gets dismantled, it's gone forever. It cannot be replaced. So we need to give the unique historic treasure we have been entrusted with the proper care it deserves and all the protection that we can afford. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth? There's another hand up for two. Yes, two other ones. I'm two going one. to elevate over um, Professor Martin. Mm -hmm. Professor, you're muted. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Ava Martin. And thank you for allowing me to speak also in support of the designation of the Western portion of Prospect Avenue as a local historic district. And as um, Mr. Bash just said, although Club Row is currently on the state and the National Register of Historic Places, that is not enough to fully protect it. I've lived in Princeton for half of my life. Uh, much of the time I've spent studying or teaching aesthetics, art history, language and literature at the university that I love. Uh, for 24 years, Prospect Avenue has been my path to the university. I've resided either in the former Butler graduate houses or in my home on South Harrison Street. And I've walked, run and biked up and down Prospect as a Princeton student, as a research fellow, as a Princeton University faculty member, as a faculty member at other institutions, and as a, prince, as a mother of young children and teenagers. I'm, oh no, mon dieu, c'est vrai? No. Uh, can you hear me? Are you yes, able to hear yes. me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. D'accord. Okay. Très bien. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, so in each of these roles, the historic architecture of the Prospect Avenue streetscape and the significant uh, ways that these buildings have uh, contributed to our community has given me fodder for reflection, for energy, a sense of purpose, and a sense of belonging. There's no question that Prospect Avenue is my favorite street in Princeton, over and above Nassau, because its historical impact has not been commercial, but rather intellectual, social, educational, and societal. And of course, I'm not alone in this. Since well before the local historic district was proposed in 1992, from F. Scott Fitzgerald to Clifford Zink to Thomas Kaufman, Princetonians have spoken and written about the value that Prospect Avenue has had in their lives and work. As Mayor Marvin Reed stated in 1995, it has been a transitional zone. And recently, others have noted its intersectional value. For example, early women alumni such as Alicia Schmucky have stated that the avenue has helped them feel that they were a part of Princeton history. And we've also recently heard that this uh, avenue has had meaning not only for privileged university students, but also for regrettably marginalized members of our community, the stewards and caretakers, the Witherspoon Jackson residents, and as well for refugees such as Erwin Panofsky and others. So for these reasons, and as a Princeton alumna 
a cultural historian, and as a concerned citizen, I request the municipality to designate a club row local historic district, incorporating structures on both sides of the street. And this would ensure the appropriate long-term stewardship of this Princeton treasure. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Elizabeth, are there more hands raised? Yes, two more. I just promoted uh, Celia Tazelar. She'll be coming okay. over. Great. Hey, hey. Hi, Celia. You're muted. Gotta push the button. Celia, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> I just want to Hello, am hello. I still, am I still muted? Welcome nope, you're on. good. All right, I just want to stay in, in favor of this uh, local historic district. Um, you know, you need to look no further than the historic preservation element of the master plan, which is the roadmap for this commission uh, for future uh, plans for designating future districts to see that this is something that has long been in the works. Uh, this is a gift. Uh, we now have um, a club council that is supportive of the Sorry, you're frozen. Uh, have Clifford Zink, who literally wrote the book on uh, prospects to prepare the uh, local historic considerations for the historic of expertise. And it's just honestly, you know, having a historic preservation element in the master plan and having these districts, I mean, that now is the time. Uh, it, everything is ready to go and let's just, let's get it done. Um, and I can add, you know, parenthetically that uh, those of you who don't know me, I was a member of the historic uh, commission, uh, the borough historic preservation review committee uh, for many years and then uh, this commission as well. So, you know, I think I'm very familiar with some of the uh, just more practical considerations when you want to do a designation, designate a historic district. It's very difficult for um, this commission with our budget and, you know, uh, budgetary restraints to get the work done. So I think this is just like kismet that there's this group out there that wants to do it. Um, you know, I was on the Historic Preservation Commission in, in the borough in 1995 when, you know, we heard all the reasons why they they didn't need this. And I, I, it's great that they've come around and, and things do change. So I just want to support it. And I think it will be um, an important step forward for the work of the um, Princeton, the cause of historic preservation in Princeton to, to do this uh, local designation. So, and I would be quite disappointed if it doesn't get passed. So I want everybody, I really hope that everybody on this commission will support it and do their utmost to, to see this happen. So thanks a lot for um, the opportunity to speak to you. <laughs> Thank you, Celia. Thank you. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. And um, Elizabeth, and any more hands? Yes, one more. Christine Lewandowski, she's promoted. Okay. Hello? Hi, Christine. Okay, hi. I, you all know me, so I'm not going to introduce myself. I just wanted to say that um, my husband and I had our wedding reception at Cloister, and people from all over the country came, or, uh, from many different states, from the East Coast and the, and the Midwest and California, and they, everybody remarked how beautiful the street was and how lovely, and it made a big impression upon people who had never seen the street before. So I just wanted to put that out there, that you know it is recognizable as a great streetscape. And thank you for letting me speak. Oh, thanks, Christine. You're thank welcome. You. All right. Um, that, was, that was the last person. There are no other hands raised. All right. 
Well, if there aren't any other questions, I guess we'll just wait for you guys to um, put together your, re your extra research on Witherspoon Jackson and then um, the kind of district and the other documents. And then, you know, maybe we'll see you soon. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I just want to add one comment. Um, so it is really great that the Eating Club is really reconsidering to, um, you know, to be um, on board as far as um, making this recommendation. And uh, the commission here actually has seen a few of the eating clubs already under the recommended districts. So I think that for you to get those endorsements from those clubs, I think that they probably um, are saying that it wasn't as bad as they might have anticipated. And I can't see it changing that much more when it is a designated. District. So I would thank say you so much. That with the football season coming up and alumni coming back, I hope the petition drive is extended to the Princeton uh, alumni community because I suspect that many, many of those voices would be um, additionally um, supportive of, of this prospect. Thank you very much for taking this time to consider this and uh, we will uh, proceed with some more research and conferring with Elizabeth and uh, and then we will be back. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Elizabeth's point. Um, um, would you like me to get then a written statement from the GICC of support? Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. It may take a week or so, but I'll get it. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Right. Thanks so much. I think you'll Thank have a more time than that, Sandy. Okay. <laughs> Give me three weeks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it'll take a little time to pull all this together. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank all you. right. We'll see you guys. Soon. Thank you. Thank you for your all right. Thank you. So I see Deanna's here. Yeah. And uh the next item on our agenda, and I think it is um the last item on our agenda is um the Witherspoon Street improvements, um, Nassau Street to Green Street. So, um, hi, Deanna, do you want to just go ahead? Yes, I would. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, Deanna, I'm just bringing as many people as I saw on the email. I just want to know if there's, um, I think that I, re I think I got everyone on there. Um, does, it, does Bernie want to come on as well? Uh, you may as well add him in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me know if I left anyone out. No, it looks like you have everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay. All right, so um, thanks for having us tonight. Um, after about 16 months of public input on the Witherspoon Street improvements between Nassau and Green Street, uh, council passed a resolution in support of a final roadway layout and um, we have brought it to actually we haven't brought it to planning board but we have been to planning board about the project and um, at, for courtesy review in compliance with the master plan and so um, tonight we are back here at HPC um, in our next step to complete our SHPO application so TNM and Associates has completed a design of Witherspoon Street in a uh, miraculous two weeks after we had the council approval for the project. And um, so let me just share my screen. We'll go through a, a quick presentation and then um, we would like to answer any questions you may have. And just to remind the commission, um, Deanna had come through originally for a concept and there was a subcommittee that was formed, which was Julie, Frida, and David Shore. And they had met independently with Deanna and other, uh, with, with TNM and other um, staff to work out some of the details. The details on the concept that we had at that time. And, and uh, I think since, since we all met, there have been some changes to the plan uh, that we'll go over tonight. 
So this phase of the project, like I said, is Nassau to Green Street. This is the first of three or four phases that we envision for the Witherspoon Street corridor. Um, we have started or continued a public discussion on uh, the remainder of the road from Green Street to Valley Road. Um, we're just in the beginning stages of the public engagement on that piece. But the idea is, is that some of the design decisions that are made for this first phase will be carried through um, the rest of the corridor. So um, as you all know, we, you know, we have a um, deteriorated road surface. Uh, we've got storm sewer issues, sidewalks are in bad condition. We have tripping hazards between the crosswalks and the tree wells. Um, and there's a variety of different uh, accessories in the area. So we're looking at, um, you know, how do we reinforce the historic characteristic of the street, improve the walkability and business climate, and create a flexible outdoor public space, um, and obviously getting into the nuts and bolts of the infrastructure, looking at roadway drainage and uh, green infrastructure to uh, clean the storm water. Um, this is the headwaters of Harry's Brook, and we are trying to do whatever we can to re reduce the outflow from this area uh, to lessen the impacts downstream. Um, so in terms of the items for HPC consideration, um, we are looking for review of the concrete pavers that are proposed both in the vehicular cartway as well as the sidewalks. Uh, also looking at street sign equipment, street lights, concrete curbing, and the green infrastructure planters. And as I noted previously, you know, some of these features are going to be used in the future phases that extend to Valley Road. Um, so here's a, uh, a screenshot of the first block or part of the first block from Nassau Street uh, towards Spring Street. And on the right side, we've shaded in the Nassau Street sidewalk to um, be somewhat similar to the landmark gray color that will be constructed there as improvements are made on Nassau Street. And tying into that within our right of way on Witherspoon Street, we are looking at a um, concrete pavers that go on both the sidewalk as well as the roadway. Um, I think when we came to you last October with Witherspoon Street, we were still in the phase of determining what the road would look like. Um, so what we're looking at now from Nassau to Spring Street is it will continue with a one-way northbound operation. We have a through lane that curb to curb width is about 13 and a half feet. On the west side of the road between Nassau and Spring, we then have a service lane. And that service lane will take, um, take over for loading and unloading activities for the businesses. Uh, it could be used for parking. It could also be used as we show here as another extension of the pedestrian space with the installation of uh, a parklet and some uh, a bike parking. So this is a 10 foot lane and it runs on the west side from Nassau to Spring at the two lane yard driveway, we have included a bump out um, just so that it does not visually look like you have two lanes running through um, this corridor. And once you move past Spring Street to the north, we revert to asphalt on the roadway and we retain the pavers on the sidewalk. And the idea is that the sidewalks will be 
uh, we'll use the paver material all the way to Valley Road. Um, so we have shown this as two, two different sizes as well as orientations, but the same color. And this varies from what we talked about with the subcommittee. Um, I think there was some internal discussion that it may be too busy with two different colors and um, the whole point of, or our understanding of the historic district is that we want the road area to really not be the focal point that the buildings and the scenic gateway for the Fitz Randolph gate should be the scenic gateway. Um, so what we've done, the entrance here at Nassau Street is um, generally lined up with the Fitz Randolph gate so that you have that view um, up the street. You also have the uh, green infrastructure that is shown here along the road um, with street trees to create that focal point and that um, linear view and, um, and homage, I think, to the, the Fitz Randolph gates at the southern end. So um, as I mentioned with the concrete pavers, in the vehicular space, we are proposing to use the midnight sky color, which is what we talked with the um, subcommittee on. And it's still, the size would be six inch by 12 inch. And they're a thicker paver because of the uh, traffic loading. And they would be run in a running bond pattern perpendicular to the curb. Um, the sidewalks in the same area would be um, the same color, like I said, midnight sky, but a larger paver, a 12 by 24, and it would be running parallel to the curb. And that's, that's indicated and shown here on the detail. Um, and then moving north from Paul Robeson towards Green Street, and then potentially beyond all the way up to Valley Road using the same color, the midnight sky and switching over to a smaller paver, a four by eight inch. Um, and, and that's necessary because there are more things in the pedestrian space with driveways, with trees and um, these pavers are better able to adjust to all of those things in that space. Um, another item that is proposed within the corridor and within the project limits is to install a new bus shelter opposite Green Street near the Princeton Cemetery. It, it would be the same shelter that we have installed on Nassau Street at Palmer Square. It's the same one that the university also is proposing on Nassau Street over by the, the extension of South Tulane. So um, rather than using a standard New Jersey transit bus shelter, we're elevating it to um, this, this more simple sh shelter that we used on Nassau Street. Um, street signs going back to the Nassau streetscape design standards. We're proposing uh, this type of signage that has a brown background, which is um, a nationally known standard for a cultural or a historic area. So rather than having the green background, we would use brown wherever it's part of the historic district. Um, in keeping also with the streetscape, we're looking at using black powder coated posts. Um, and in the streetscape plan, there was a recommendation to use this TSB 60 finial, round finial. And that's also uh, shown on this image on the slide. So there aren't a lot of options for the finial. There can't, it can be a flat cap 
Um, I think there was a horse head, um, probably a floor billy. Um, so that would be something, uh, you know, that we would like some feedback on, on that finial. Um, and it also then ties in with the street lights. So with street lights, we, the municipality currently owns the pedestrian level street lights in this area on Witherspoon Street. And um, we are looking to remove and replace all of the lights with a PSC and G light. And so we're proposing to um, use the Montclair Black Pole, the Granville Prismatic Acorn with the, oh, sorry, with the Leaf Classic housing. And that's the images of that street light are, pro are provided here on the right side of the slide. You see at this application, um, the town chose to use a black finial on the street light, um, but there is an option for a clear finial, a ball, um, everything that's shown over here on the left-hand side. So um, that we would appreciate some feedback as well on that. Um, and then in terms of the green infrastructure, and this is, this is a, a major piece of the project is to manage stormwater and bring landscaping and um, the street trees back into this corridor. So we've been working closely with TNM's landscape architect, as well as Princeton's um, municipal arborist, Taylor Saputer, to put together a simple planting plan um, and adhering, you know, as much as we can to native species um, and obviously everything that is appropriate for a corridor like this. So. Uh, I've provided you here with a snapshot of uh, a portion of the landscaping plan, and I think the entire landscaping plan was provided in our packet to you. Um, and then just in terms of detail, what these, these planters would look like, um, TNM provided this image here on the left. Don't, don't go by the plant material that is in there. But essentially we are looking at a concrete box and that's shown in the detail here on the roadside of the, um, of the planter. You would have a curb that could be up to six inches and on the sidewalk side, you would have a curb that's six to eight inches tall. And, and it's actually small walls that extend down below the road, um, serves many purposes. One of the purposes is to retain the pavers to make sure that it has a, they have a solid surface um, to connect against. And then it also helps um, create this bioretention swale area. Um, that will have amended soil to treat the storm water that is generated within the road space. Um, there will be little cutouts um, along the curb to allow water from the roadway into the planted areas. And then you see here, we've got an overflow system with an under drain that will take the excess water and um, any, any water that remains after the, the period of time that needs to, uh, it needs to be out for treatment purposes. So, so this is what we're looking at. Um, another, another consideration with these areas is that on um, the first block of Witherspoon Street, we also have basements that extend out into the roadway or into the sidewalk. So we also have to be cognizant that any improvements that are, we're doing near those basement structures, we, we need to not impact those. Um, and so 
that's another reason why having kind of a contained stormwater system like this um, will help then protect any basements that may exist on this side of that planted area. And so I think that was it. I can always go back to any slide if there's questions, um, but we'd like to just get hear feedback from HPC. Like I said, TNM Associates, uh, Tejal's here. She has our SHPO application ready to go. And so we'll, we just need to work with you for the, the final comments um, to put into that. So I have a question about timing. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, how, how fast do you need to get this to SHPO? Um, Tejal, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> so we created a very fast uh, track schedule. We were waiting for this meeting today. Um, and then I put in tomorrow's date. That's how we rolled with this project. So I'm not gonna lie about it. The sooner the better. Tomorrow is the most best case scenario <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, and uh, I mean, nothing else is changing. This is what it is. Um, I see me as me and up, so I'm coming to you, Mia. Um, but yeah, tomorrow, is good, but it all depends upon what you guys want to say. Okay. So we have, Mia, just real quick, we have um, a few moving pieces. So TNM has completed the plan design um, per the contract so that we can be in accordance with our funding from the state. Um, those plans have been submitted to the state for review. We have our access permit submitted to the state and it's been found to be complete. Um, this permit needs to be submitted. The, the idea is, is that we're going out to bid in August um, to be in compliance with the DOT requirements to have a contractor on board in September. Construction will not occur most likely until July, I mean, sorry, January, <laughs> January, 2022. <laughs> but yeah, these are all the, the pieces um, that have been fast tracked because we're catching up from uh, between COVID and our extended public engagement phase. I see, so the only, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mia. Well, you know, I happened to tune in early, so I, I, you know, heard the previous presentation. It was interesting that a number of people mentioned, um, you know, when, when, when they have friends who come to town and they felt that Prospect, the Avenue, and Nassau Street were emblematic of the town. But of course, you know, um, we know that Prospect Avenue and Nassau are, are often synonymous with a, a vision in which the university has, you know, a, a certain preeminence, but Witherspoon Street has been the town's street. And so I do think it's really incumbent upon us to have a coherent aesthetic vision for this street. And, and I, you know, um, I don't know what that is. It certainly doesn't exist now. <laughs> the, bow, the bar is pretty low and it hasn't existed for a while. Um, I, but I, but we have this tremendous opportunity right now. And, and so I, um, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm now I'm like really concerned about a lot of these little details and I'm sorry, Deanna, don't shoot me through the zoom screen, <laughs> but I, I am just concerned now about like the brown signs, do the brown signs match with the blue pavers? And like, and, and, and do we, you know, it's, can we, do we have, does this all have to be just, I mean, I think overall it's, it's, it's good. I think we're, you know, we're, we're, and I, and I know that De uh, Deanna, you've been, and Tejal, you've been so patient with the public and with council and with all, and the plant with all of us. And, you know, so, so, but now we're down to some, it's great that we, we have the luxury now to focus on the aesthetics, but, but I, I think the aesthetics are really important. And there's also the other, um, I don't know how granular we are, are getting right now, but you know, um, 
all of, there are all of these different dining areas. And so what is the furniture going to be of the, you know, of, I know that, um, that EDC needs to work that work out what you know the the whole thicket of regulations that's going to exist between the different you know uh, restaurants and what their legal connection to the town will be and how that will regulate their space but do we you know I think that's equally an important part is you know what is is that um, we don't have what we have now which is just a bunch of different furniture that's sort of thrown out there and and I mean I think so Yes, I what I would like to see is a coherent aesthetic vision and I and I and I think I, I'm just wondering like, can we work along with um, uh, is there an is there an ability to to continue to um, fine tune some of these details um, as as or does this all have to be decided by tomorrow. Uh, from engineering's perspective, we have in the past um, been able to work with HPC in their review letters to indicate that certain items were still under discussion and negotiation. Um, most recently, that was on, I think, Bank Street and the Nassau Streetscape in that area where we were having ongoing discussions and looking at different materials. So, um, I, I think that's definitely an option. And um, in terms of the signs, that's from the Nassau Streetscape guideline. Okay. And that um, has been reviewed by SHPO, I think, in the past. Um, but we're, we're definitely willing, um, as long Ooh. as it's something that can be defined when we go out to bid. Um, you know, because you can't leave it too open ended for a contractor to give a price on. And did the committee that was working for HPC work to sort of harmonize the plans for Witherspoon with what I hope will be, you know, uh, forward momentum on on Nassau Street in terms of the streetscape? Right. We we did discuss the changes on Nassau Street. Um, but when we looked at Witherspoon Street, there were three different materials selected, one for the roadway, um, one for the side of the road, and then one for the sidewalk. So going to just one paver um, is a change, but it's one of the colors that we had selected, I believe. It so, is. So that's consistent with what we had chosen. We also had looked at lighting, um, but I don't know if we'd gone into any detail on, um, you know, the, I think we had decided that the top part would be clear, not solid. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember Frida? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think we had, and we had looked at several um, options. Um, I mean, honestly, looking at this, um, I feel like, you know, we spend the time selecting three different finishes and sizes and all of that, and now it comes back completely different. Um, not that it's not nice, but I feel like, almost like why were we called in to give an opinion when and Deanna, you know, this is just my opinion and you'll always get it straight from me. Um, yeah, I feel like there was a direction from the beginning and I felt that um, our giving an opinion was, you know, almost just to endorse it. I'm not saying the final design and stones aren't, you know, don't look good and won't look good. And I do understand your, um, your reasoning for it. But Mia, to address what you saying about the uh, cohesiveness we never consulted on the chairs and and all the furniture and anything we were presented whatever had been decided and it did not include that because probably the chairs and all the furniture would go through the merchants association um you know that might be something to bring up to them i don't know if the township is is planning on purchasing furniture 
are you, Deanna? Um, so I have had a preliminary conversation with the Arts Council of Princeton because public art is um, an important item to really enliven and engage a streetscape area. And so I have a preliminary conversation with them. One of their ideas actually was to um, solicit proposals from artists in the area of potentially creating seating that is also art or uh, you know, thinking outside of the box, there was an idea of, say, a large teeter-totter where we have a bump out that creates a sidewalk area that's 25 feet wide. Um, it, it's just, this is just an example of an idea. We have not gotten to the point of thinking about those accessories because right now we're focused on the construction piece. Um, but we're willing to, you know, take all recommendations and considerations on that. Um, and like I said, we'll probably want to work with the um, public art committee as well for what options we have within this space. Uh, um, Michael? Julie, Deanna, I was just going to jump in real fast. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I guess we might not be as clear as we should be about what we're asking the HPC this evening. But, you know, basically, as we've been going through the design process, we've tried to really end up with a very simple and elegant design, something that, you know, doesn't scream a certain period of time or won't look dated in a few years. And I think you've all been a part of that discussion where we really try to pick classic materials, simple colors, you know, simple uh, street furniture, that sort of thing. So I think, I guess what we're asking for is, are we in concept going in the right direction? And as specific details uh, evolve, you know, this is kind of be, is going to be an ongoing project. We certainly can come back to HPC and get some guidance. I, I think that was what this thinking of staff was this evening. Yeah. And like okay. Michael said, we were looking at simplicity. And so that was why we shifted to one color palette mm -hmm. just to make it very simple. So at that, and it also, so that you didn't, really define a pedestrian space versus the vehicular space. You wanted it at least through color to look as one space and then by varying the size and the orientation of the pavers distinguish something that is more pedestrian versus vehicular. And I do want to point out that the sizes that we chose did not change. All it is is that we took out the separate color for the sidewalk area. Okay, now Roger had his hand up first. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think I'm fine in two dimensions. Um, I was wondering if there are any photo sims or anything that would stack the design up against the facade so we could get a better sense because where the lights fall, where the trees fall, uh, I mean, that may be a later detail, but uh, it's very hard to integrate the historic facades with a two-dimensional rendering. Um, I know Tejal, that was one of my comments to Tejal, or how are the trees, trees aligned with the buildings? Are they in front of doors? How are they located? Um, Tejal, I know your landscape architect has looked at this. Yeah, she said that she has looked at it, and um, I think she's she also sent a response back. I'm, I was just trying to look up to it. Um, yeah, that also played into the material types um, because we wanted maybe less dense street trees so that you could see through to the buildings more. Um, I mean, we can prov we can work to provide. Uh, something that can show you like building doors versus tree placement, if that's helpful. Yeah, and I was going to add that if you notice in the plan, the trees are pulled back from the buildings and then they're going to be further from the buildings than they are today. So that I think will really help everyone be able to enjoy the architecture more because the trees are going more towards the center of the street. Uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm just more concerned with the gestalt of the whole uh, plan given the historic uh, nature of the streetscape and the facades. I mean, it's just, I just can't picture it um, 
looking at the plan and uh, I conceptually understand the streets, the trees rather being further from the, the buildings, but uh, maybe I'm alone in, in inability to, to picture this in three dimensions, but I'm just having a hard time. So I just, Deanna, I just pulled up Kendra's email if you, and I'm just going to read it verbatim, okay, because I'm not a landscape um, architect, but what she said that, uh, was that she looked at the tree locations in relationships to the entrances of the building, and she does not see any direct conflict, okay? She also said that it will be hard to avoid blocking of all the signs on the street as of now, and also to achieve a symmetrical and consistent tree planting plan. But she says that as time goes by, the bottom tree limbs will be trimmed up and will be open and it will open up uh, view sheds to the building mounted sign, okay? She also said that, uh, I also want to add that the signs vary from building mounted signs to hanging signs. And given this will be a more pedestrian oriented space, I do not think the tree placement will impact the views of any sign. That was regarding the signs on on the buildings and stuff like that. And she also wrote that my guess is that for the next 10 years, it actually will be more open than it is going. You just have to give it some time. Um, Tom and then Elric both had their hands up. So go ahead. So this looks like a very well considered plan and I appreciate all the good efforts of uh, the township engineer and the architects as they advance this vision. My question is about the pavers. Did I understand correctly that the, the vehicular surface will also be consisting of pavers? Yes, from Nassau Street to Spring Street. So my question on that point is, what's the maintenance plan? Uh, the comparable that I'm thinking about is State Street down in Trenton, which is about the worst main street in the county, thanks to the pavers there that have never been serviced properly. And anytime somebody has to go dig up the road, they cold patch it with uh, black tar and it creates about the ugliest surface you could imagine. So what is your thinking for how you're gonna maintain uh, this, these pavers in such a way that they uh, maintain their beauty that you intend? Yeah, I wanna first go on the construction portion of it and then you can pick up the maintenance portion. Usually what people do is when they install pavers, they install them on the existing bituminous surface. What we are going to do or what we are proposing is that we are taking out the existing bituminous surface or the asphalt, at least 12 to 14 inches that you have, okay? We're gonna put in new five inches of DGA. We're gonna put in eight inches of concrete and we're gonna put in an asphalt layer on top of it with a primer or new pairing pad and on it, uh, we are going to install um, the pavers. That's going to give it a substantial amount of um, uh, strength. You know, it's not going to wobble. It's not, it's the bituminous layer that we're going to put that's going to keep it intact. Okay. We're going to have weep holes um, uh, for proper drainage and stuff like that. That is something that a lot of towns don't look at when they start installing the pavers. They just put it on top of something, you know, uh, with a sand bed. And that's why you have these pavers that just kind of come out. About. Sounds expensive. So we, have thought, we have thought about that. But then yeah. maintenance is also going to be a key, which I think Deanna is going to pick it up on that. But this is, I think, a solid, solid detail of construction of any type of roadway pavers within vehicular car lines. So. Right. So um, we've been working with our public works department along through this process so that they understand um, what they are going to be given to maintain because it's not just the pavers, all of this green infrastructure that they're receiving as well, that's going to require maintenance. Um, and with construction, TNM will provide us with maintenance manuals for all of this. And um, we've already been discussing about whether this is something that our own public works creates a designated group that works in this area or whether we need to outsource um, some of this. So, so we were still um, trying to determine the best route for that, but by having this solid infrastructure in place per um, Tejal's description. I think that goes a long way. 
a lot of places you'll see, and you even see it here in Princeton in the uh, brick crosswalks that we're slowly getting rid of. Um, you know, there's various strengths of materials for the pavers themselves. And so we have selected a paver that um, has the most durable finish and it's sufficiently thick for the loading that it will have. Unlike, you know, say the four inch bricks that are out there now in some of these locations. So it's, it's all boots and suspenders to make sure that we have quality materials in the construction first so that the maintenance um, on the backside will be less. This implies a much higher cost though for the whole project compared to a regular routine road, doesn't it? Um, you know, this project will be a challenge and it will be costly just because of the phasing of construction. Um, and I, I mean, we're within budget, within the estimate that we've been provided at this point. Uh, I mean, if you think life cycle, in 10 years, we'd be back resurfacing the roadway, most likely, maybe even sooner if we actually have a pavement preservation plan in place. So, um, you know, these are 25 year um, paving systems. Is that right, Tejal? Yeah, he said 15 to 20 years. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because of the thickness that we are going to use for within the roadway, this is all recommended by the paving company, uh, the paver uh, manufacturer himself. So, yeah. Um, Elric, you had a comment? So, I, I, I am a skeptic, but I'm, I think the thing is, yes, Witherspoon Street is different from Nassau, certainly from Prospect. It has traditionally been... Um, I mean, from it was a residential street until the mid 19th century, but in the in it, for a long time, it's been where individual um, mom and top pop type uh, enterprises have have existed, and with a lot of with that kind of commerce, and I know a certain amount of that is just disappearing everywhere. Um, I remember, I can't believe it's probably 30 years ago when the surface was last changed. And at that point, when they dug up the street, they, there were still trolley tracks being pulled out from the, from the 19th century. One thing I noticed was where the bus key, kiosk is, um, there's one surviving pole from the trolley that's right on the edge of the street there. I wouldn't want to see that interfered with because that's part of its history. Um, I, 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 I think that I, I guess it's the serendipity of um, of a street that's uh, that was sort of in the in the in the individual tastes of all the various uh, store owners and and residents that gave it some character and, and it um, it's a little scary to me that this is in some way being it's I love the fact it's being planned that things are being anticipated I don't like that that there's going to be a bit of a bit more conformity than than it, than I'm used to, but um, I, I I know too well how, how much time has gone into this. I appreciate it, and I I I guess I look forward to seeing what happens. Elric, would you mind just talking about the conformity that we're creating versus what already exists on the street? Um. I, 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 hard to say. Uh, I mean, the, the, the architectural background in me says, oh yeah, let's go for something which really, you know, where, where the, the individuality comes out with the storefronts and the, and the differences in the eating areas and the signage and all that. And I hope that's what happens. Um, the, the fact that the, um, you know, I, I Palmer Square was all planned at once, and it, that's part of why it's so different from Witherspoon Street. Witherspoon has, has just has a sense that one business or another has changed one storefront or another, and I, I hope that the build, the individual buildings themselves will, will lend themselves to that. Um, I really, I wish you well. I'm just a little, I'm, I'm, I'm a little 
concern. The other thing that concerns me is that so many, much of this planning happened during the pandemic era when traffic was so radically diff different because of students not being around, businesses being closed and whatever. Um, and I, 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 the, when the volume returns, as I, as I can't believe it, it won't, um, I, I hope that reducing the width of the street and, and, the, and the amount of traffic that's going to be moved to other streets um, doesn't, um, doesn't um, create its own chaos. I like the fact that the trees are further away from the buildings. I, it's sort of sad that the existing trees are going, but I know that those pear trees are vulnerable. Um, but if they ever, if in 25 years it's decided that the street needs to be two lanes and not one, at least half those trees are going to have to go at the same time. I won't nope. be around. Nope, they don't actually. <laughs> the, the good thing, Elric, is the way that it's designed is all of that green infrastructure and the trees can remain. And all we need to do is um, take out the bump outs and the service lane can become part of the road and it will be uh, a two-way, it could be a two-way street for you. at 23 and a half feet wide. Okay. And I know right, I so see that the trees will have more nourishment than they get now. Yep. Yeah. So as far as what you need from us today, I mean, I think, you know, we've discussed actually the brown street signs is something we discussed before. It's a national um, standard. If you go to New York, you'll see if you have a brown background, it means in its historic districts. So I think that's a kind of a nationally um, recognized program. And then as far as the, the lamps go, I think, you know, we're always on the side of simple, you know, clean and simple. Um, but like, as far as other details go, like the, the seating and everything Mia was talking about, um, is there flexibility? So our next meeting isn't until the end of August, but I mean, if there's stuff you need from us, then you could come back. Well, if you, I mean, we could reach out to the subcommittee again and talk through these details um, in mm -hmm. more depth, if that works for you. Um, it delays yeah. Cajal, but she's become used to that. <laughs> and I think it just gives us a better application if we can work through those items and, um, come together on a, on a combined, you know, vision for the road. So Deanna, I do want to add one thing. I understand that the seating, the outdoor seating and everything else is not engineering. It's, it's, it's art, more of like an art, architectural aesthetic part of um, uh, Princeton that is to be adopted a, a, a either, either via an ordinance and uh, I don't know how you guys are going to do it, but how does that impact the plans that we have created is what I want to ask. Um, we are not showing seating anywhere. We are not showing any type of street furniture uh, within our plans. How does that impact our application to SHPO? Maybe, yeah, yeah SHPO will need to see what type of warnings uh, you're going to put in or what type of um, but, other But we're not building, check. yeah, we're not building any of that at this time. So, right. so how, I, how I, I, I hope that it can be considered a separate application um, okay. because I, as was mentioned, you know, with outdoor dining opportunities, I mean, it's also our vision that property owners will see the opportunity and want to put structures off the facade of their buildings to make it a more habitable um, seating area more of the year. Um, and so I know there has Michaels and I have, have um, gotten questions about that as to how is that going to be handled? Is there going to be some sort of a design guideline for the road or is it going to be individualized by the property owners and um, 
you know, and then they each have to do separate applications. So I think, uh, I think we need to talk internally between Elizabeth and Michael more about that. And, and we would come back on a separate um, application for those pieces. And I think it's obviously it's a council decision ultimately because it's in the public right away. Yes. So I think we can end up with some good design guidelines. I didn't mean to throw a wrench into today. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned it. I just, you know, today was council's first opportunity to really engage with this subject and thinking about it from the historical perspective. So it was a little bit, I, you know, this was, I, I was just thinking about that as well, but not proposing that it would be related to the engineering. So sorry, this, I, the last thing I want to do is throw anything more into poor Deanna's, uh, <laughs> This is this has been an arduous path for her, and um, you know I'm sure that there will be plenty of opportunity to to uh, deal with the accessorizing at some other time. I think that'll be more fun than this process has been. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank um, you. I, I guess do you do you have what you need from us? I mean, I think that's you know as long as we're engaged in the following discussion. Um, you know, well, you can reach out to the subcommittee. Frida, are you going to be around in August? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I think so. I think I'll be around. I don't have any plans. Okay. And then David uh, lost power today. Oh. And he missed it, but he, I think he'll be around too. So, you know, okay. we can, there we is can... one question I think Tejal probably needs right now, sooner than later, is the concrete curbing those walls that we propose on the green infrastructure, should they be a tinted color to be complementary to the paver color that's selected? or can they remain as regular gray-ish concrete? Yeah, Elric. I think there's, I think you need to define the edge. Um, it seems like, uh, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little hard to, to differentiate and the size of the pavers isn't gonna make much difference when you're driving. So I, I can't, I favor the idea that there be a, a distinguishing uh, order. And regular concrete is just so ugly. But I think that's what Elric is saying, unless we tint it white. Um, I mean, in the past, I think over on Bank Street, we're using tinted concrete for the curbing, but typically it's just a gray color. Yeah, like, well, I, think I, mean, that, uh, I think on Bank Street, you went back to granite, right? At for a portion of it, correct, yes. Okay, and what's out there right now on Witherspoon? Witherspoon in our project area, I think is both concrete and granite. Um, Majority is granite, yeah. It is, but the problem is... Um, as we have found, <laughs> Ian popped in, as we found with the Bank Street project, granite is incredibly expensive and hard to procure. And if we are burying the majority of it, um, it just doesn't seem to be a cost-effective option in this corridor. And what's the relief that you have on, that's gonna be showing? How much is it? Less than six inches? It's six, inches. six inches. Six inches. Yeah. Okay. You need so, that much. so it's a regular curb height. It's a regular well, curb height, correct. Well, if you if you tinted the concrete, would there still be some contrast between the color of the tinted concrete and the paver? That depends upon the tint of the concrete color that you use. But yes, there could be, yes. I mean could we tint it similarly to what's on Nassau Street? Well, Nassau is granite. It was French gray, right, on Nassau? Gray. French gray. Well, it's landmark gray now on the sidewalks, but the curbing okay. is bluestone or granite. 
Um, I mean, we can work with the subcommittee on that. Um, okay. But Tejal, I would say, um, error on the side of using tinted concrete. Okay, so what happens is right now we just change the line item number. It doesn't change anything on the H on the shippo. Well, it does because we got to we got to put it in the color of concrete um, of the tint. Well, what we can say is that it will be, um, you know, agreed upon by the HPC subcommittee and and. Uh, engineering. Okay. We've accepted that in the past. Okay. So currently we have certain attachments um, that includes um, um, your um, authorization uh, to TNM. If that is just like a, a letter from HPC, it would um, make um, the shipper application more solid saying you can concur or not concur or whatever your decision is with any type of comments that you have. Um, and then for the, the, for the concrete curb part, you can say the, the tent will be decided at a later stage or whatever, you know, and then I can include that as another attachment. That's one thing that I wanted to add. Okay. Okay, but would you, would you need something from HBC like yesterday or, I mean, can that be included later? Um, yeah, and I leave that to you. It's up to you. It's fine. It just it just solidifies the application. That's all I'm saying. Whether you do it, we I can say it's following. You know, in a in a week or so, or I can hold on. Yeah, we'll the application we'll, for a week. Yeah, you know? I'd say submit it, and we'll work with Elizabeth and Julie on the right verbiage. Um, I'll too. Yeah, um, thank you, Michael. I'm sorry. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah, we'll maybe. work together and with Lindsay at Shippo to make sure it's what she needs while it still gives us the latitude to continue to have these discussions. I mean, it sounds like in general, there is some agreement with these materials that we propose today. Um, it's just going to be the fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And we can state how we're going to continue to work with the subcommittee moving yep. forward. Yep, definitely. Right. Okay. It, it's nice if we get as much flexibility as we can get to, um, you know, make decisions in the field rather than on Zoom. Yes. <laughs> it's always easier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So you know, now we go ahead with sub submitting, right? Yes. <laughs> And then we don't mention anything about a follow-up HBC letter. I can add that that on my cover letter to them. Yeah, well, we'll we'll say that we attended this meeting and that a letter is forthcoming. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, we look forward to continuing to work with you guys. Thank you. We oh, appreciate you so your much. your guidance on this. As we've heard many times, we're just engineers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, HBC, for having a council here today. This was such an interesting meeting. I'm, I'm, I, the, all, all of the components of it were really interesting. And it was so yeah, nice. It took me a little bit to recognize you from the other day. <laughs> I only got one tick bite. Oh, wow. <laughs> We heard about your uh, your go your outing in shorts into the tick infested lands. Oh well, I was <laughs> so I had the sort of no man's land where I could see them, but I missed one. So oh no. <laughs> anyway, but we're going to save that house. That's that's the main thing. Mm. I hope. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Do we have any more public comment? I just got to check. Um, there are no hands. Sorry, um, there's no hands up, but um, if anyone in the public would like to speak, this is the public comment section that's open. So please raise your hand. Madam Chair, there are no hands up. Okay, well, then we go back to staff reports. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything? Um, I do not have any staff reports, um, but um, as Elric kind of mentioned, he did go out to look at the property um, on 
Lanwin and Mount Lucas. Um, he did a, a, a little site visit because um, Madam Chair, as you know, that there is the open space on that project and they just right. wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything um, historic that was of significance prior to them removing them off the property. Okay, all right. So well, I don't know if El, I don't know if Elric, if you want to talk on that or. or if um, I sent you photographs of the bike five minutes before the meeting started. There was a traffic stoppage on my way out here, but anyway, um, the main thing is there's a there's a, a house I think built in the 1940s that's back on that property. And it's in broom clean condition. It's obvious that somebody's got, gotten into it. I took a photograph that you'll find when you when you see what I sent in. Um, it, it's it's a well built um, house that would look compatible on Jefferson Road or something like that. Um, the barn is a, a nondescript nineteen mid twentieth century building, but it could it could serve a of various functions. There is one historic structure, which is pretty interesting. And that is that there's a wall for a bank barn and um, it's the build out of that, that talus like rock up on the hill there. Uh, but the mortar and the join and the joinery between the mortar, the, the, the ridge um, uh, pattern, that's 18th century. And um, so it, there is remnant from an early farm there. Um, I, I me, I never did find that the, 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 the other long barn, uh, wherever that is, uh, I didn't get to I, that. I think I, I think I imagined it. Well, I, 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 I took that cul-de-sac and I couldn't see a way to get back there without going through somebody's yard. So I, I, I chickened out. I just but. think I was so traumatized by having to go through what felt like the jungle for hours before we got to it that I, I, I think I imagined, you know, something that was more but we did we were aware of that that stone structure and i it's, i'm so glad that you know what it is because there was a lot of discussion at the time and no one you know could you know no one had any idea of, of what it was so that's really helpful what was surprising um, to me was the other day when we were at the sewer authority the, the the waste management authority that the garage there i noticed years ago and we took a building from that property that the foundation, that the walls of the barn really aren't uh, cinder block stuccoed. They're, they're the stone foundation walls of a barn and it's a bank barn. So that even though the land at that point is fairly flat, uh, they actually had a ramp going up to the threshing floor. Well, the same thing was true of the remnants that are in that property, which is really fairly nearby. And um, uh, anyway, it's a, it was, uh, it was curious to me. There's a there's a there's a foundation wall in the woods near Karawogis, which is also a really early barn. Um, um, much more in the anyway. It, the three of them are interesting together. And I, I and I'm going to go through. Inter, I did a one room school reunion for the people that grew up around Mount Lucas, and some of their stories about that hill um, had to do with the fact that that's what there there was a beacon tree during the revolution. That's when they would when they would have, they would create a sort of bird's nest of, of dry wood at the top of the tallest tree on a ridge. And then if the British were coming across, they could climb up there and torch it and say in Lambertville, you could see the, the ridge in, in Mount Lucas, that sort of thing. They also remembered Indians. They remembered a stream where you, there was no visible stream, but you could put your ear down to the rocks and hear the water flowing. So that it's, it, that big tract of land May reveal some interesting uh, some interesting details. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, shut up so we can adjourn before some the public shuts up. <laughs> field work. It was really that was quite intrepid and much appreciated. So. Well, thanks, Elric. Um, anything? If there's nothing else, then that's it for our agenda. So, uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. All right. My mouth is. And a second. Okay, Tom seconds. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thank see you. you at the end of August, probably August 30th. All right. right. And I'll let everyone know. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.